Um, first, I want to apologize, everyone. Sorry, my voice is pretty rough, so if you can't understand something at some point in time, uh, feel free to put a comment in that talk bubble, and uh, we'll try and clarify towards the end. So uh, this presentation we put together on bark beetles um, is mainly to kind of re-educate, make sure everyone's on uh, the same page when it comes to treating for pine bark beetles and kind of assessing what 2018 is going to look like. And I can tell you just in the last four days we've gotten two inches of rain, um, <coughs> excuse me, out here on the coast. So we are seeming to get a late rain season. So we're, we're kind of waiting to see the snowfall and how that's going to really affect the beetle flight. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we had some warm weather early on, which means the beetles may have come active. And then all of a sudden we get these storms that come through that dump a lot of snow, and we can actually get sometimes beetle kill with that because they've already become active, starting to move around. Temperatures drop, and it actually can kill them off. So we're going to have to kind of wait and see what the progression is. But for the most part, um, if you guys have been paying at all attention to the California drought monitor, we've been hearing people talk about the fact that California is going back into a drought. <clears throat> um, but by looking at the drought monitor, you can kind of see that, yes, we, we have a few abnormally dry areas, and Southern California has always got its issues with drought. Um, but right now, it, it's not a need for us to be terribly concerned. But do I think we've gotten enough rain and moisture to get us out of the drought conditions in the mountains with the bark beetles? Uh, the answer to that is no. If you kind of look at uh, how the drought kind of moved from 2011 to 2015, you can see uh, our drought monitor right now is looking very similar to what we saw in 2011. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we're at the early stages of this potential drought um, exasperating the bark beetle issue. So with that, we need to keep educating as much as possible, um, explaining to the people that we, we may see a dip with this late snow season um, in initial populations, but that the trees still do not have enough water to effectively fight off uh, these beetles. So even if we get kind of a drop off initially, uh, the beetle population will increase again. So we're going to kind of keep our fingers crossed to see how well we can come out of this, this drought. So this is the time of year when we start seeing our temperatures normally warm up. Um, and, and with that, this is when people start noticing the dying off of trees. So in the slide you can see uh, the tree on the left, I have it circled. That is literally that same tree on the right three months later. When we were there and took the photo, the tree was still alive and green. Um, and then all of a sudden we got a warm up. The tree started trying to pull water and found out it was girdled, couldn't pull water, and immediately just torched up and died. It's a very fast death. It's very common uh, with beetle infestations to have that kind of death. And this, we're coming to the season where homeowners start noticing and seeing that. Um, so they will not realize the damage has been being done uh, for months in advance, um, and we're just now resulting in seeing the, the tree actually die. <coughs> this also makes it difficult for our applications. So we might get out to a tree, we will evaluate it and say, okay, it still looks green, still looks pretty healthy. Uh, we think it's a good candidate for treatment. And then, you know, we come back a few weeks later and actually do the treatment, and we see it already starting to decline. Um, I always tell people there's a good test you can do on long needle pines, pull the needle, bend the base of the needle back around to the tip of the needle and make them touch. And where the needle bends at the apex, if it breaks or kinks, odds are the tree does not have good trigger pressure. There's not a lot of water in the tree, and the tree may already be girdled. Um, if, the, if the needle bends nicely, you don't have an issue. You have plenty of water. Uh, it should be a, a go for treatment on that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Something to look for this time of year. Uh, this is something that does make spring applications a little more difficult. Um, part of the reason why we tend to lean towards fall applications. Uh, we don't get this possible instance of treating a tree and having it die in the next month. Um, <coughs> sorry, I do apologize. So 
the one thing I always try and stress, and this is kind of how you need to pass it on to your customers, is that usually if we still see a green tree, there's still good trigger pressure and water in those needles, we can usually treat and protect those trees. But as soon as we start seeing any sort of yellowing or off color, that's usually when we get into stage two, and that means galleries have already been done and there's already a lack of water flow up through the vascular tissue. With that, that's when we already know the tree is not savable. Um, conifers are the type of tree that usually once you start seeing them go into decline, they don't have the ability to recover from it. Um, and then, of course, you know, once we hit stage three, when all the new beetles start to exit, that's when the tree is usually red and dead. <coughs> and I always joke, if it's gray, it means somebody should have done something a long time ago. But when we're dealing with this, it's important to kind of explain the stages to customers so they know what they're looking at. And, of course, you're going to get the questions of, well, what if I just see a dead branch here or a dead branch there on the tree, and it's not the whole entire tree? That might be a situation where um, a beetle may have tacked below the branch and has caught a, caused galleries below the branch and cut off water flow to that branch so the branch dies. Um, in those situations, the tree is probably still tra- tra- savable, but it is a sure sign that you have a beetle infestation. Um, the other one that can come from this is if you see a tree dying from the top down. Um, this can usually be blamed on the tip ip, um, the ip engraver beetle, and essentially what it does, it attacks the top third of the tree. And with that, you usually get the top third of the tree that dies, and then it kind of stops. So a lot of times we can still treat a tree and protect the tree from attracting in other beetles that may attack the rest of the tree and kill it. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Those are some of the different stages of death that we look to when we're doing uh, bark beetle applications. So western pine beetle is still pretty much the number one beetle that we're seeing um, up, up in the mountains. And with this one, it, it's always had a one-year life cycle. We last year and the year prior clearly established that they're having two life cycles in a year because of their overwintering at different stages. And so it made the standard flight of, you know, mid-June through kind of August um, null and void. And we saw them flying early in February and well into October. So unfortunately that, that means we have to protect the trees for a longer period of time. But that also means that these trees are under attack for a longer period. Uh, A lot of times we rely on the time when the beetles aren't flying to get a treatment in and let it start moving inside the tree, but we don't really have that opportunity as much. Uh, So we see uh, more chances of actually pairing injection with spray, where if it's already in peak season, the beetles are already flying, we'll go ahead and we'll inject the tree, and then we'll actually spray the tree at the same time protecting the tree for a while while the chemical has a chance to move inside the vascular tissue of the tree. <laughs> so the other thing I want to kind of mention when, when dealing with the western pine beetle is initially there hadn't been as much concern about it vectoring the blue stain fungus. Um, the mountain pine beetle, which we'll talk about next, has always been the notorious vector for that disease. But once the disease gets into an area, um, it spreads much quicker and more beetles have the ability to pick it up and move it. And so where we used to just be concerned about western pine beetles and other beetles killing the tree, now we have to worry about the disease that they're bringing along that we're seeing. Um, So just be aware that western pine beetle is also vectoring that disease now. So mountain pine beetle, um, that was always the one we were kind of more concerned about solely for the fact that it was vectoring the blue stain fungus. With this particular beetle, we're seeing the same life cycles pretty much as the western pine beetle. Um, With it, however, this one we pretty much always kind of knew would be bringing along the blue stain. Um, With the blue stain, if you see little spots of it here and there, it was not too large of an issue. But as the beetle infestation grew and spread, they spread the uh, blue stain fungus even more. So now we are having more trees dying of pests as well as disease. 
So you can kind of see in that photo uh, in the bottom there, uh, cross section, where you can literally see the blue stain fungus fully girdling that tree rather completely. So this was a, a case where it wasn't actually the beetle attacks that fully girdled and killed the tree. It was actually the blue stain fungus. And so that's something we, we try and remind people is we might have gotten in early, in the early stages, two, three years ago, when we didn't have a whole lot of blue stains present, um, and we were just doing uh, insecticide applications. But now that we've uh, allowed the blue stain to, to get in and spread more thoroughly, we're now having to go back and on our retreatments, look at retreating with the insecticide as well as the fungicide for blue stain fungus. Um, I have had a couple questions where people wanted to know I'm on my off year, so I treated last year. We now know we have blue stain fungus in the area. Should I go in and treat um, on our off year, the year we wouldn't use the insecticide, with the, the fungicide? Honestly, um, it is a very virulent disease, but I don't think I would actually go in and put in additional injection sites, I would probably hold off until the next year's application and do it with the insecticide and the fungicide. Um, if they're really high-value trees and people are like, no, I want to do it, it, it won't hurt. Um, it can only protect. Uh, I just try to avoid multiple trips going back to the same trees. Um, and with this spreading not quite as fast inside the tree, um, Usually you can still be okay for a year. Um, however, a lot of times, though, we prefer to get the fungicide in um, preventatively uh, because it is more effective on a preventative level. All right, so Ips and Graver beetles, that's the other one we're seeing up there quite a bit. Um, this one's more difficult because it usually is in the top of the tree. Very few times can you actually see the beetle activity besides the symptoms in the tree. I mean, they actually do produce frass, and sometimes there's a little bit of pitch that comes out. But um, I've used the binoculars. It's really hard to see it up there. Sometimes you can, especially if it's new, moist uh, sap coming out, and it's the right time of day. You kind of get just the right angle. You can kind of see it glistening. You're like, oh, okay. Um, so, But keep in mind, the life cycle on Ips is, is much, much shorter than on Western or Mountain Pine Beetle. I mean, you're really looking at like 21 to 40 days. I mean, over winter, it is a longer period. But so we see usually a much higher population of the Ibsen graver beetles. And so they're much more destructive than a lot of times people realize. And it's just because of their mass of numbers that they can reproduce. So if you have western or mountain pine beetle in an area, you can pretty much be sure that you have the Ibsen graver beetle. It does tend to be the first one on site it usually weakens and stresses the tree, and those weakened and stressed trees you now attract in the western mountain pine beetle. So kind of keep that in mind when dealing with this, um, that ips are usually the front runner. They're usually the first ones there. So if you're noticing pitch tubes on the main third trunk of the tree where the western mountain pine beetle hit, look to the top of the tree. There, there's probably going to be some damage up there as well. Okay, and then the last beetle that we've run into quite a bit is the red turpentine beetle. And um, with this one, it's a very different pest in the, in the way it attacks. Mountain pine beetle, western pine beetle, Ips and graver beetle, they all go in through the bark and make galleries underneath the bark. Um, the turpentine beetle doesn't actually do that. It actually bores straight in, and it goes through the phloem and xylem, and it gets into the heartwood. And it does a lot of damage. It comes back out, goes in, makes very large galleries. The beetle itself is actually much larger than both mountain and western pine beetles. Um, and so there's been, there's been some controversy on this one, I will admit this. Um, if I go up into Arnold Groveland, into those foothills, um, we tend to see it as a secondary pest, meaning we probably already had mountain pine beetle or western pine beetle or somebody else come in and attack the tree first. And then we kind of see um, the red turpentine come in. And if you usually have more than five or six hit sites around the base of the tree, it's kind of usually a death warrant for the tree. And I say usually, um, because every now and again uh, we see trees that actually survive it. 
the beetle doesn't do that much girdling damage in that outer layer. It's more structural. And so we see the trees actually survive their attacks sometimes. The problem is, is when the red turpentine beetle attacks, it usually stays on the bottom three feet of the tree, and the pitch tubes are much larger. But with those, um, because they're in a concentrated area on the tree, there's that likelihood with the larger galleries that they make to do more girdling damage in a concentrated area. And that's exactly what we see on Monterey pines, um, more through the Monterey and the coast area, where we actually have pine trees dying specifically and solely from red turpentine beetles. So it's hard to say. People usually say rarely do red turpentine beetles kill a tree on its own, uh, but in some areas it, it very much does. So just know that if you have this pest in your area, you should definitely be treating. It does have the ability to do a significant amount of damage to a tree. So those are the main beetles we have. Um, I always kind of show this slide so you can kind of get a quick idea on how you can identify between. You can usually tell by the location on the tree, top of the tree, you usually get the ips. Uh, middle of the tree, you usually get mountain and western. Bottom of the tree, you usually get the red turpentine. And um, pitch tube, red turpentine is always the largest. Ips is always the smallest. Mountain and western are pretty similar. But the way you can really tell them apart is their galleries. So if you already have downed trees, Maybe PG&E came in and they were very helpful and they fell a bunch of trees and just left them sitting there. Yes, that's a, a very easy way to identify which beetles you have attacking in the area. You can just walk over those trees, pull the bark, and you're going to see the galleries below. Um, mountain pine beetle goes in straight up. Larvae go out to either side. Very distinct. The only one that looks kind of similar is the spruce beetle, which we don't deal with too much, but we do have. Same thing, the adult goes in vertical, but all the larvae get together and go out one direction or the other. Mountain or Western pine beetle is complete chaos. There is no rhyme, no reason, no organization to it. And then if engraver beetle are kind of uh, circular with spokes coming out. Um, and then, of course, uh, the red turpentine beetle doesn't really make galleries below the bark. Uh, you see a lot of uh, tubes throughout <coughs> uh, Sorry, uh, the entire trunk of the tree at the base. So when people start talking about the treatment options, um, pretty much you have uh, spray, splat, or inject. That's the easiest way to sum it up. Um, so pretty much spray, that, that's always been the, the tried and true. And, you know, it was actually not, it was very effective when we only had the one flight and it was a short window of, you know, June through August. Um, that meant one application, one and done. People just go out, spray the trunk of the tree, call it good, and not have to come back to the site until the following year. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, once the beetle's flight got longer, that meant we had to come back twice a year uh, to do two applications. Um, and even at that, uh, you still didn't cover the entire flight window of the beetles. So the biggest issue, though, really kind of actually boiled down to, forgive me, um, the applicator accuracy. You can just see in the photo of this gentleman spraying, pretty much people go up and hit two sides of the tree. They don't usually take the time to walk all the way around and thoroughly cover the tree. So you get areas where you can get strip attacks of beetles going in. Um, once the beetle's in, the larvae is not affected by the spray on the outside of the trunk. Uh, so the gal they have the ability to go in and create galleries around and still girdle the tree and to introduce the blue stain fungus. So that's something that... Uh, we found as main reasons why there was failure. Um, but, of course, it, you can't do it in, you know, uh, riparian areas or sensitive areas in a place where you have water. And, of course, you're dependent on the weather. If you can actually go out and do the spray applications. So spray, we still use it, though. I mean, like I said, a lot of times with trunk injection, if the beetles are already flying, I advocate to spray the tree as well to give that extra protection while the chemical moves. And then there's splat. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback on this one. Um, I know uh, there's been a lot of misinformation out there, and if it's not used properly, it is completely ineffective. When used properly, it does have some benefit. Uh, the big issue with this product is that it mainly works on the mountain pine beetle. Um, it is really not effective against the western pine beetle, the Ips engraver beetle, or the red turpentine beetle. 
So if you have a homeowner or a customer who really wants to use this, the way it's designed is to be a barrier. So you don't want to go and put this on every tree because eventually the beetles, the mountain pie beetles, are going to start to ignore it and go into the trees in the area. This works when you have a large property and you're looking at like 20 acres and you want to protect your property. You kind of go along the property line and you put that splat on all those trees along that property line to make a barrier to stop the mountain pine beetle from coming in onto the property. Um, we've seen it used that way. It is effective that way. Uh, but again, you're only deterring one of the four beetles. So um, there is some effect to it. It is rather inexpensive. Um, I guess if the homeowner wants to take the time to go out there and do it, but they need to understand what it really does. So if they think by using it they're going to save their trees and do nothing else, it's not true. They're going to end up losing all their trees due to the other beetles. <coughs> and if not applied correctly, still from the mountain pine beetle. So there is good information on splat, but it, it really requires us as applicators educating our customers because there is a lot of misinformation out there as well. So just as a quick recap, on trunk injection is the most important thing we can do is dose the tree correctly, and we do that by measuring the diameter of the tree at breast height. Um, honestly, I know sometimes it's hard to get the products in the tree. I understand. I've been there. Um, and the less dose you get in or um, the lower amount you get into the tree off the label affects how long it's going to protect the tree. So if you're going in at the high rate and you want to get the full two years, but you're only really getting maybe the low end of the medium rate into the tree, you have to be careful to make sure you're, you're still assessing that tree because the chemical might start wearing off, you know, almost at two years, not quite making two years. So getting the amount of chemical in the tree is, is the first one. And then, of course, uh, the other issue we tend to see happen is uh, when people actually drill in this tree to put the plugs into the tree, Um, If they don't set those plugs deep enough so the product's going into the xylem tissue, then what ends up happening is the chemical can go between the bark and the cambium, and it's not absorbed as well into the tree, and some of the chemical can come back out in the bark. And once again, you're underdosing the tree. So now you you might be again in a situation where you're not fully protecting the tree for those two years. (coughs) And then, you know, once you get those plugs in the tree, I always say you can use any three pieces of equipment. But please, really, that handheld is quick yet. Um, it was not designed for injecting conifers. Um, it's, it's hard on your hand. It's hard on the equipment. And usually we see a lot of underdosing uh, when using that particular piece of the equipment. I admit I'm still a huge fan of the Tree IV uh, for doing bark beetle applications, mainly because I just keep setting up equipment. Um, so usually equipment becomes your limiting factor for speed. Um, once you get enough equipment, you can just kind of keep leapfrogging as you go. Uh, the only time I find that that's not effective is when you're not doing large numbers of trees. You might be going to Mrs. Smith's house and you have two trees and you, you set them up and one's taking forever. The other one's kind of moving along and you're like, okay, now I'm sitting. Um, that's where I have found the quick jet hair has become very effective. Um, it keeps the applicator working and you can kind of keep the process moving a little bit faster. Um, would I go out and do bark beetle applications with only the quick jet air? Nope. Uh, and it's mainly for the fact that if you get that one really slow tree and you're stuck at that tree with that quick jet air and only that quick jet air, you could be stuck at that tree for quite some time. So it's best to be able to set it up and move on to your next tree um, to keep yourself always moving at the quickest pace possible. <laughs> so I kind of went into the depths of the tree IV and quick jet and quick jet air and when to use them and when not to use them. Um, but that's one of those things. Uh, there's so many different tips and tricks uh, that I don't quite have time to get into on, on this uh, PowerPoint. But the one thing that I will say is you guys come up with most of the ideas. I tend to share them. Um, and the one I'll share on the quick jet air is uh, I, I've seen a number of people now uh, take the black needle out of the front of the quick jet air and take the line 
from the tree IV system and plug that line into the front of the quick jet air, and now you have four ports coming off the front of your quick jet air. So it actually gets you moving a little bit quicker uh, when doing your application. Uh, so <coughs> excuse me. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if you find you're running into a situation where you're, you're getting frustrated, you're not getting it done as quickly as possible, or you're having issues with application, please don't hesitate to call me. I, I'm, I'm happy to talk it through and see if there's ways we can figure out how to speed it up or if there's any issues you might be having. So the whole trick of this is we've got to get that chemical onto that xylem tissue. Um, I had one person ask me if they could not use the plug with conifers. So ArborJet systems can be used plugless. We just use a different needle in the tree. Um, however, with conifers, you really need that plug to create that pressure to help push it into the tree. Um, we find doing it without the plug, if you can imagine it, is even slower. So we definitely want to make sure we use the plug, and we want to make sure we get that plug into that xylem tissue of the tree. And I put this in here as the recap for you guys, because really these are your statements when selling tree injection to your homeowners and your customers. Um, people always want to hear that, you know, they're doing the best possible thing for the environment. They're saving their trees. Um, well, trunk injection, is that the first thing we tell people. You know, the chemical stays trapped inside the tree. It's not in the air. It's not in the soil. It's not in the water. And you're getting the full dose in the tree, so you know you're getting the maximum possible protection against the pest inside the tree. And in doing so, we get the longer residuals, um, which customers always want to hear that, you know, it's kind of like a, can it be a one and done? And initially when this bark beetle outbreak started, you know, we, we were like, hey, it's possible this could be a one and done scenario. Um, but unfortunately with the long drought we had and the lack of really good winters thereafter, um, it's definitely not a one and done application. We're going to have to circle back around to a lot of our customers and reapply. So <laughs> um, in doing that, start looking for treating both the disease and the pest when you circle back. Um, and, of course, you always want to tell them that this is research-driven. Um, so these are a couple of the research studies that we, we've done over the years. Actually, this one in 2005 was one of our first ones we did, and it was just us going up against spray specifically. So in 2005, we injected and we sprayed uh, Onyx and Fipronil. 2006, we sprayed Onyx and Fipronil. In 2007, we sprayed Onyx and Fipronil. And going up against that one application, you can see how much injection did better than just spraying every year. So it's one of those situations where we try and convey this message to the customers. We can put it in door hangers and handouts um, if that's beneficial. Uh, but a lot of times uh, they can actually Google research. Um, I know uh, uh, Dr. Chris Vedic has a new poster presentation he's putting out uh, specifically on uh, treating for bark beetles. And so those sort of things, when it comes from independent research, it does help kind of prove the point. Um, it's not got the Arborjet name on it. It's completely independent. So feel free to find those. If you can't, give me, uh, send me an email, shoot me a text. I'm more than happy to share those research studies with you. Um, and this one is just one trying to convey the fact that we actually get much better control if we treat and fall. And this, this was literally done with just injection. So that's kind of what we'd expect to see. So if you inject in spring, you run the risk of attacks coming into the tree because the tree pests are now active and the tree is not fully protected. So the best time to really do your applications is fall to get in the tree so it can circulate through winter so when pests do come out in spring, the tree is fully protected. Okay, and then so triage has always been the chemical we've used, the amamectin benzoate. Um, this is what all the research has been done um, it's actually one of the only products on the market uh, that actually has bark beetles on the label. So we have other amamectin benzoates coming out on the market, um, but none of them have the uh, actual bark beetle on the label. Um, some of that has to do with their ability to dose. Some of that has the ability to do with their research and the residuals. Um, so kind of keep that in mind when looking at products. I know people weren't too excited. Some people like the fact that the old triage is an RUP, restricted use by federal standards. Um, which means you don't have to do the notifications, but it does mean you have to show your license to purchase it, and it has the warning label. Um, for people who only have one QAL on staff, the old triage meant that QAL person had to be on site with the applications. Uh, when we now came out with uh, 
triage G4, basically it took the RUP status off. It became a general use. So now, again, you can have your applicator out in the field, your QAL in the office, as long as he's a phone call away. And, in fact, it's a little tricky up in the mountains because you know how well the cell service is sometimes. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. But it also did drop it down to a caution label. So same thing, has bark bill on the label, uh, same performance. The only real difference is uh, we do notice that G4 does go into the tree a bit faster. <laughs> Sorry. And then propozole is what we use on the blue stain fungus. Uh, the active ingredient is propoconazole. Um, and this is what we like to apply as a preventative. Uh, someone asked me if this could be bark sprayed onto a tree, um, and we have not found good movement into the tree, so it's actually not labeled on there for it. Uh, so injection of this product is still the preferred method um, <coughs> for, for treating blue stain fungus. And the whole key to actually making this whole system work is uh, water. Uh, I know that it's something you guys deal with on a regular basis. Um, sometimes we're dealing with trees that haven't had any water, um, and just to get them to take the material in, we have to give them a little water to kind of activate those fine root hairs. Um, really, I find it doesn't take a whole lot to activate those root hairs. Uh, so go ahead, um, five-gallon bucket at the initial application, a few hours before the application, the night before, it helps just getting the product in the tree. Um, and then to get the product to move quickly in the tree, you kind of want to get that good watering afterwards. Um, it's nice if we can ask the homeowner to do it, but usually, you know, if we ask them to water a tree, uh, they'll water it, you know, like every night for the next, you know, month and drown the tree. Uh, so we have to be a little careful. Make sure you give them guidelines. <coughs> One good soaker hose over uh, overnight is plenty. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. All right. So the only thing I want to point out is, <coughs> oh, I'm dying. I apologize. Is if you're going to take the time to water the tree, add one of these products in. It really does help <coughs> hold the product in the root zone of the tree. So a lot of times we add water to dry soil. That water just wicks out to move out to other dry soil. But if by adding this product in, it helps hold that water right in the root zone of the tree so the tree can actually use it. And if you get into the hydrotain ES plus, ES plus and Nutri-Root, <coughs> they have eight additional components that help with the tree's uh, health. There are uh, macros you can see in there, but they're very low numbers. So they're not something that's designed to stimulate growth. <coughs> and so... Uh, the last few things you can also do beyond trunk injection and spraying and using splat uh, to protect trees is, I know this is a hard one. This is tricky. Uh, try to get them to uh, not prune trees or do tree removals after April or before October. Uh, the wounds literally attract in the beetles. I know we, we can't get pg and &E or any of them to change their schedules, and there's so many dead trees. There's constant tree work being done. That's just exasperating the problem. So unfortunately, if you can communicate this to a homeowner, you know, that's our one chance to make a difference. So if you can explain that to them, that'll help make their property look less enticing to the beetles. And of course, try to alleviate the drought symptoms on their property. Try and get them to water their trees responsibly. Um, I know that was always a challenge. And then of course, remove dead and dying trees. Um, we know PG&E is just dropping them. Um, we've had some homeowners go out and cover those trees in plastic um, that are adjacent to their property. Uh, PG&E has not complained. Uh, they kind of wash their hands of them after they drop them. So um, that is something they can do. Uh, but the ideal thing is if any trees are being removed, they really need to be fully removed, chipped, and then have those uh, wood chips solarized with clear plastic. That's the only way you can get a good knockdown. I've had some people ask me, can we spray? Um, go out and, you know, hit the tree afterwards with bifenthrin or something of that nature. Uh, it does have some effect, yes, um, but not, not very much. Those trees take a long time to dry out. You have to go out and reapply a couple times. 
Um, the other thing you can do is remove the bark from those dropped trees, uh, especially the stumps of those dropped trees. If you remove the bark, that xylem and phloem tissue dries out so much faster, and you usually can't get a single life cycle out of how quickly it dries. <coughs> so that's kind of the ideal um, way to prevent the spread of the pests once the trees have already been dropped. So I apologize for the condition of this presentation. I picked up a nasty cold, and I can't wait for the weekend to try and get better. But I thank you, everyone, for uh, bearing with me in this presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, I can go ahead and answer those now. And, uh, yeah. Hey, Don. So it looks like uh, Karina was asking if injection treatment is most effective in the fall. Is it better to wait? Uh, to leave the tree untreated for however mon many months from now until the fall or to inject when the tree issue is encountered, even if that means doing it before the fall? It depends on the pest pressure. If you're doing it preventatively, that means the beetles have not started attacking the tree, the beetles aren't necessarily on the property, I would say, yes, you can wait till fall. Um, if the beetles are already attacking the tree, if the people, beetles are already pretty much on the property or the adjacent property, you know, you want to treat as soon as possible, get that tree protected as quickly as possible. Okay, very good. Well, um, if at any point you didn't understand any part of this presentation, please feel free. There's my contact information. Uh, send me a text or an email talking to not so great, and <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Uh, everyone rest up, especially you, Dawn. Yeah, uh, and again, uh, we did record this, so it will be posted uh, by middle of next week on the ArborJet website and the ArborJet YouTube account. So feel free to uh, check in and take a look and rewatch it or share it with your friends and coworkers. Thanks, everybody.